authorized to declare a recess of the committee at any time. I now recognize myself for five minutes for an opening statement. So one of the most amazing things about serving in Congress is the access members have to <laughs> expertise on every issue imaginable. The range and complexity of issues that members encounter on a daily basis can be totally overwhelming and schedules leave little, if any, time for doing independent research. So the ability to call on subject matter experts for nonpartisan analysis on issues before Congress and in the districts uh, back home undoubtedly helps members do their jobs better. Expertise also helps Congress do its job better. This committee has done a lot of work focused on strengthening Congress's Article I capacities and ensuring that Congress is well staffed with expertise is an important part of that. The legislative branch uh, branch's informational and analytical capabilities need to be on par with those of the executive branch if Congress is to fulfill its obligations as a co-equal branch of government. The legislative support agencies make Congress and its members smarter. Armed with budget scores, policy analyses, legal assessments, and accountability measures, members are better equipped to make informed decisions on behalf of the American people. So today's hearing is about showcasing the terrific work that GAO, CRS, and CBO are doing and highlighting the innovative steps they're taking to update their products and services. This committee recognizes the tremendous value these agencies provide to Congress, and we're looking forward to supporting their work in any way we can. Today's hearing will also consider how Congress's support agencies can adapt to best meet the needs of an institution that's constantly evolving. Easy and quick accessibility to information is key for members and staff who spend much of their days on the go. If a question comes up in the middle of a hearing, staff should be able to instantly find an answer using their phones. Expertise that meets members and staff where they, where they are is also important. A junior staffer in a personal office probably has different informational needs than senior committee staffers. And while some members want verbal briefings, others prefer dense reports, tailoring information to the end user's needs, facilitates learning, and ultimately helps members and staff better serve the American people. The expertise that's available to Congress is truly remarkable. It's also somewhat of a mystery to many who work on the Hill. I'm hoping we can also discuss how the agencies can ensure that members and staff know about the incredible array of resources available to them. The committee will once again make use of the committee rules we adopted earlier this year that give us the flexibility to experiment with how we structure our hearings. Our goal is to encourage thoughtful discussion and the civil exchange of ideas and opinions. So here's the wonky part, therefore. In accordance with Clause 2J of House Rule 11, we will allow up to 30 minutes of extended questioning per witness, and without objection, time will not be strictly segregated between the witnesses, which will allow for extended back and forth exchanges between members and the witnesses. Vice Chair Timmons and I will manage the time to ensure that every member has equal opportunity to participate. Any member who wishes to speak should signal their request to me or Vice Chair Timmons. Additionally, members who wish to claim their individual five minutes to question each witness, witness pursuant to Clause 2J2 of Rule 11 will be permitted to do so following the period of extended questioning. I feel like I really nailed that, you guys. All right, I'd like to now invite Vice Chair Timmons to share some opening remarks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning. Great to be with you. Um, sorry for the schedule uh, change. We appreciate you all accommodating it. And really, I just want to say thank you so much for coming yourselves. It means a lot. And we are here to uh, discuss how, what additional tools and resources you all need to do your jobs better. And um, we've been trying to fix the same problems for decades. Uh, immigration comes to the front of mind, um, debt, health care. We're not really getting very far. And we got to change the way we're doing things in Congress. And so uh, the purpose of this committee is to how to make Congress more effective, um, efficient, and transparent for the American people. That's the tagline. But really, it's how do we solve these big challenges that we're facing? And honestly, your, your role in how to make Congress do its job better could, could not be more important. Um, the resources that you all provide really make a big difference. And the question is, what can we do to help members of Congress and to help your um, various groups, support agencies, make us better at our job. And so really, we appreciate you taking the time. Our, our hope is to uh, figure out what we can do to help you do your jobs better so Congress can do its job better. So um, again, just thank you so much for taking the time to come yourselves. And we look forward to um, learning more. and. Uh, be prepared, this is not a normal hearing. We will all ask questions and we will go back and forth and it is really more of a round table setting. So it, it, it should be fun and again, thank you for being here. And with that, let me 
um, invite up our second panel. And while they're coming up, I'm going to uh, read their bios um, just so we can stay on schedule. Um, we're now joined by three experts who are here to share their ideas for modernizing the products and services the legislative support agencies provide to an evolving Congress. Witnesses are reminded that their written statements will be made part of the record. Our first witness is Zach Graves. Mr. Graves is the head of policy at Lincoln Network. His research and advocacy focus on the intersection of technology and governance issues, including work to strengthen science and technology expertise and capacity in Congress. He's a member of the GAO's Polaris Council, an advisory body of leading science and technology experts. And in 2018, 2019, he was a technology and democracy fellow at the Harvard Ash Center. Uh, Mr. Graves, if you're ready, uh, are you ready? All set. All right, cool. We're just rolling, because uh, I, I, I went a little over time with that last panel. So you are now recognized for five minutes. All right, thank you. Uh, Chair Kilmer, Vice Chair Timmons, and members of the committee, thank you for having me here to testify. Uh, my name is Zach Graves. I'm head of policy at the Lincoln Network. We're a right of center organization working to uh, advance innovation, governance, and national security, and work to bridge the gap between Silicon Valley and DC. Uh, this year marks the 100th anniversary of the Nonpartisan Government Accountability Office. Over its history, GAO has provided essential oversight, insight, and foresight to Congress, supporting its legislative and oversight functions. This, works, this work has a direct and tangible benefit to taxpayers. Over the past 20 years, GAO's work has resulted in more than $1.1 trillion in savings, GAO's return on investment has consistently exceeded over $100 for each dollar of its budget. Uh, despite its impressive record, however, GAO's tools and resources have not kept up with demand. Even as federal spending and the national debt have massively increased, GAO's staffing level is 30%, 37% smaller than it was three decades ago. Uh, over its 100-year history, GAO's mission, authorities, workforce, and strategic focus have evolved significantly. The agency was established as the General Accounting Office in the Budget and Accounting Act of 1921, moving this function out of the Treasury. Coming out of the New Deal and heading into World War II, growing federal programs placed significant new demands on GAO, and it expanded to nearly 15,000 staff. The next few decades saw GAO move away from its green eyeshade era of accounting-focused work towards program evaluation and a more professionalized workforce. By the late 1960s, GAO was recruiting more staff trained in non-accounting fields, including science and technology in particular. Uh, with the backdrop of an unpopular war in Vietnam and the aftermath of Watergate, this period also saw Congress reassert itself. This included uh, major reforms in the Legislative Reorganization Act of 1970, increased staffing resources, the creation of the Congressional Budget Office, which testified earlier, and the Office of Technology Assessment, or OTA. These reforms helped rebalance Congress's information asymmetry with the executive branch and allowed it to reassert itself. Coming out of the Cold War and heading into the 1990s, the pendulum swung back away from Article I. Congress downsized GAO and enacted across-the-board cuts to the legislative branch, particularly in the 104th Congress. This included reductions for committees and support agencies and the elimination of OTA. The GAO uh, emerged out of this period that was perhaps more lean and responsive, but also significantly more risk averse. Uh, science and technology in GAO, uh, since OTA was defunded, there have been numerous efforts to reestablish its function. This led to the creation of a technology assessment pilot in GAO in fiscal year 2002. Uh, while it had some initial success and was praised by outside reviewers, it did languish in relative obscurity for nearly two decades. In January 2019, GAO elevated this program to become the SCAA, or Science, Technology Assessment, and Analytics Team. With the support of the current Controller General, uh, SCAA, SCAA has doubled its staff, refined its TA methodology, produced numerous spotlights, technology assessments, and other kinds of analysis, and its Innovation Lab has worked to develop innovative new approaches to program evaluation and oversight. A congressionally directed report by the National Academy of Public Administration endorsed SCAA, but echoed longstanding concerns about the suitability of GAO's culture and bureaucracy for S&T work, and particularly for technology assessments, highlighting that there are some, some major challenges remaining to its governance. 
In my written testimony, I list actionable recommendations to improve SCAA's governance, including adopting some of OTA's structural features, like an advisory version of its Governing Technology Assessment Board, mirroring the relationship that CRS has with the Library of Congress, and having an appropriations line item and congressional budget justification. Importantly, these are ultimately still under the Controller General's authority and not an independent office. Providing additional bureaucratic separation is also something that can be done as a spectrum and not an either or. Nor is this an original idea. In 2004 and 5, Rush Holt and Ammo Houghton advanced a bipartisan proposal called the CSTA that would create an OTA-like office in GAO and went through several rounds of vetting by then Controller General David Walker as well as s and experts and there are several iterations of this draft with commentary that I'm happy to provide. Uh, I also list a number of low-hanging fruit improvements to enhance SCAA, including giving it an office in the Capitol, a separate website and intranet portal, and to have it self-initiate more reports under the CG's authority rather than uh, to react to issues on request, which can take uh, a year or more to complete and often are out of touch and not uh, appropriately you know, doing horizon scanning and the important of sort of foresight work that is key to science and technology issues. Uh, I also offer recommendations to strengthen GAO writ large, including estimating potential savings from un unimplemented recommendations, which is something that was discussed at the earlier panel, addressing internal IT challenges, increasing funding for the agency, and adjusting its funding model to be a share of federal discretionary spending so it's not constrained by the particular political environment of the legislative branch's 302B suballocation. I also propose a series of reauthorization hearings to address the full range of GAO reforms, many of which I was not able to get to in my testimony. Uh, throughout its history, GAO has shown it can adapt and restructure to meet new challenges. It's gone through several iterations in the past with new tools such as machine learning, cloud-based data, analy data analytics, and others, GAO has a monumental opportunity to modernize for the next century and advance a vision to transform Congress's ability to understand and oversee federal programs in real time. Yet, I fear the low salience of these issues, insufficient resourcing, and institutional bias towards the status quo risks depriving GAO of significant opportunities to stay relevant and maximize future taxpayer savings. As we move into the future, we must consider that risk aversion in this domain is itself a massive risk. I look forward to the important work of this committee in helping address these challenges, and I thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you, Mr. Graves, and I encourage folks to look at the written testimony, too. I appreciated you had a number of recommendations you thought this committee should pursue, and I know we weren't able to get to it in your, in your um, verbal remarks, but uh, I really appreciate it.